So our next speaker, <laughs> Suzanne Alvarez from uh, Humboldt University Berlin. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I would like to talk about competitive analysis and approaches to overcome negative worst case results in the design uh, and analysis of online algorithms. These approaches have been around for more than 25 years, so in the first part of this talk I would like to briefly survey some of the existing techniques and then in the second part of the talk I would like to study the list update problem uh, a cornerstone problem in the theory uh, of online algorithms and again I would like to focus on refined uh, analysis techniques. Um, online algorithms in general have been investigated extensively over the past years, over the past uh, decades. Uh, in an online problem decisions must be made with incomplete information about the future. In a, in a general scenario, the input arrives incrementally over time. So we receive the uh, input as a sequence of input portions, I1, I2, I3, and so on. And whenever a new input portion arrives, uh, an algorithm, an online algorithm has to compute output, has to react not knowing any uh, future input. Despite the handicap of not knowing the future, we seek algorithms that achieve a provably good performance. And in, this, in a seminal paper, Slater and Tarjan proposed, uh, introduced competitive analysis, where an online strategy is compared uh, to an optimal offline strategy. The optimal offline strategy knows the entire input in advance and can always construct an optimal solution. So, here, an online algorithm is called C-competitive if for all input sequences the cost, the cost of a solution computed by A is at most C, uh, is at most C times that of an optimal solution for that sequence. And this is a strong worst case performance guarantee in the sense that a competitive algorithm has to perform well on all possible inputs that might even be generated by an adversary. For many problems, for many online problems, competitive analysis works very well. It leads to small constant factor performance guarantees, approximation guarantees, but there also exist problems uh, where the competitive framework leads to overly pessimistic results and this became apparent already in the very first paper by Slater and Tarjan where they also analyzed the paging problem, the classical paging problem where we have uh, to maintain a two-level memory system consisting of a small fast memory and a large slow memory. The goal is uh, to serve a sequence of requests to memory pages in the system so as to minimize the total number of page falls. Slater and Tarjan showed that popular online paging algorithms uh, such as least, least, least recently used and first in, first out are k-competitive, where k, this parameter k, is the number of pages that can simulta simultaneously reside in fast memory. So it's the capacity of the fast memory. This factor k is best possible uh, as far as deterministic algorithms is, are concerned. No deterministic strategy can uh, do better. While these results are interesting from a mathematical point of view, they are not very meaningful from a practical point of view, because a real fast memory, a real cache, can usually store several hundreds or several uh, thousands of pages, so the competitiveness of K is huge. On the other hand, in practice, both LIU and FIVO have a good performance in practice relative to the optimum, achieve very small approximation guarantees, and a second drawback is that uh, in practice LIU typically outperforms FIFO and this does not show uh, in competitive analysis uh, either. And these phenomena of uh, very high, very pessimistic competitive ratios occur uh, in other online problems uh, as well. Uh, there exist basically three approaches uh, to overcome such negative results, or let's say I listed three approaches. Anupam to, uh, tomorrow will talk about yet another approach, but this slide uh, talks about three approaches that are very prominent. Um, one is uh, resource augmentation. So. Here uh, we give in resource augmentation, we give an online algorithm more resources than an optimal offline algorithm. The online algorithm is handicapped 
by the fact of not knowing the future, so why not give the online strategy a bit more resources? In a memory management problem, we could provide an online algorithm with some extra memory in fast memory, let's say, or in a scheduling problem, the online strategy might be given faster machines. And more generally, uh, we might give an online strategy uh, more flexibility to serve uh, the input. A second approach is to define a refined performance guarantees where we relax the constraints of strict competitiveness and a third, in my view, very interesting and fruitful approach is to characterize real inputs. In practice, the inputs are not generated by an adversary, but often have a special structure. For instance, in memory uh, access problems, they exhibit what is called uh, locality of reference. And in the following, I would like to briefly review uh, each of these techniques and uh, let me start with uh, resource augmentation, uh, we can reconsider again the paging problem and assume that an online strategy is given K pages uh, of fast memory. So the uh, online algorithm has a cache capacity of K, whereas an online, an, uh, sorry, the optimum offline algorithm has only H smaller than K pages in fast memory. Slater and Tarjan in their original paper showed that in this case, the competitiveness of deterministic strategies drops to k over k minus h plus 1. So as you can see, when k grows relative to h, this performance guarantee uh, approaches 1, which is very nice. So we, we obtain small uh, approximation guarantees. In scheduling, as I said, we can assume that an online algorithm is given faster machines, while an optimal strategy has speed 1 machines. Uh, an online algorithm might be given uh, machines of speed 1 plus epsilon for any positive epsilon. This framework of resource augmentation was proposed in a very nice JCM paper uh, by Kaliana Sundaram and Proust. They considered uh, the classical problem of minimizing the total flow time of jobs on a single machine, a prominent classical problem. In standard competitiveness, uh, it is not possible to achieve a constant competitive ratio. The competitive ratios depend on the number n of jobs. Now with resource augmentation, one can achieve a competitive ratio of 1, over, 1 plus 1 over epsilon. So for instance, very nicely using a speed 2 machine, we get down to uh, a guarantee of 1.5, which is nice. And this, uh, this result is also achieved by very natural algorithm, shortest elapsed time first. This is non-clairvoyant setting where we don't have information about the job uh, sizes. And there exist many more papers uh, in this framework, which I do not mention here. I just mentioned one recent result published uh, in 2009, Stock 2009, where the authors basically extended this result to uh, parallel machines, where we have parallel unrelated machines and want to mi minimize the weighted sum of flow times. Um, I mentioned that uh, there is also the possibility, or people have looked at the approach of giving an online algorithm more flexibility to serve the input. I removed this material, but if I have a few extra minutes now, I can maybe mention it. So what, what uh, could this flexibility mean? So Rajiv Modwani, he proposed an approach where in a parallel processing environment you are able to uh, migrate jobs. So you are allowed to do a limited number of reassignments among the machines, which is, I think, very natural. Or there is a uh, uh, another approach where you are given a job buffer. You, so some of you might know the classical problem where you want to minimize uh, make span on parallel machines. This is a classical problem by Ron Graham investigated in the 1960s. So you get a sequence of jobs and want to minimize the make, uh, make span so the latest completion time of any job. So Graham proposed a greedy algorithm list scheduling where you always put a job on the least loaded machine. This is a too competitive algorithm 
algorithm and um, you can hardly do better. This is almost optimal. You cannot get below 1.9 in terms of performance guarantee. Now if we get a small job buffer, so in addition to the machines of course we have a small uh, buffer and any incoming job is first placed in this buffer and a scheduling algorithm then takes some job from the buffer then with this additional job buffer you can get down uh, to a factor I, I think 1.45 uh, so there is a significant uh, drop in performance guarantee. Uh, okay then uh, the second approach uh, the refined performance guarantees various concepts have been proposed ranging from loose competitiveness to bijective and parameterized analysis and to various worst order guarantees. Here I would maybe just mention the diffuse adversary proposed, introduced by Kutsu Pias and Papa Dimitrio in a paper entitled Beyond Competitiveness, uh, Beyond Co uh, Competitive Analysis, very close to the workshop uh, topic and they uh, proposed the following framework. They assume that the input is now generated according to a, a probability distribution D that comes from a known class capital delta of distributions. Now we analyze the ratio, maximum ratio of the expected online cost to the expected uh, optimum cost. And this framework uh, allows us to restrict the input just by looking at smaller classes of, of probability distributions, of course. This is closely, uh, closely related to uh, the third framework where we want to model the real inputs. Um, as I said, uh, the, this is a promising approach because in, in practical applications the inputs are not generated by an adversary. The challenge is always to find suitable models that characterize uh, the input. Uh, for instance, in the paging problem, real-world sequences exhibit locality of reference, meaning that when a memory page is requested, it's likely to be requested again in the near uh, future. And there exists a considerable body of literature on paging with uh, locality. Again, the challenge is to find good models capturing locality. And on this slide, I mentioned three models. Uh, there exist a few more uh, in the literature. In a, sem a seminal paper addressing uh, paging with locality, Borodin et al. introduced uh, excess graphs. So we are given uh, a graph that may be directed or undirected. The vertices represent the memory pages and now two pages may be requested, reference one after the other, if they are uh, adjacent in the excess graph. Alternatively, one can model a locality using Markov chains. And finally, I would like to present or mention briefly a third model proposed by myself a few years ago. It, it relies on Denning's uh, working sets, a concept that you find in standard textbooks on operating system. Denning uh, observed that if in real world sequences, if you determine the so-called working set size, that is the number of distinct pages, the number of distinct memory pages referenced in windows, so in, 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 in subsequences of uh, length n, then for variable n we obtain a concave function, a very slowly uh, increasing function reflecting the fact that in larger windows actually very few distinct pages are uh, referenced. And yeah, these concave functions uh, represent a very simple framework modeling locality. Now for each of these models one can then do refined analysis of paging algorithms and achieve smaller performance guarantees, smaller uh, than K. Um, this concludes um, my brief survey and let me move on to the second part where I would like to study another problem with respect to data, model, data modeling and locality of reference. It's the list update problem which beside paging is a very basic and very central uh, problem in online algorithms. Uh, the initial paper by Slater and Tarshan also addressed paging and uh, list update. Um, and I would like to present results that were obtained jointly uh, with Sonia Lauer. So this list update problem is also a very classical problem with a large 
body of literature uh, with, yeah, with uh, papers that date back to, to the 1950s and 1960s even. In this problem uh, we are given an unsorted uh, linear linked list. The important aspect is that the list is not sorted at all. As input we receive uh, a request sequence sigma where each request specifies uh, an item in the list. To serve uh, a request an algorithm starts at the front of the list and then searches linearly through the items until uh, the desired item is found. So here to serve the first request to item X we start at the head of the list and then traverse the items Y Use the until we hit the item X. Serving a uh, request incurs cost, more specifically serving a request to the i's item in the list incurs, of, incurs a cost of i. Service cost is equal or proportional to the depth of the referenced item in the list. And then uh, after a request, uh, the referenced item may be moved at no extra cost to any position closer to the front of the list. This can lower the cost of subsequent requests. In this example here, it would be a good idea to move the referenced item to the head of the list because then the second request to X could be served at a cost of one. But again, we are in an online setting where decisions must be made without knowledge of any future request. The goal is to serve the entire request sequence so that the total service cost, the total excess cost is as small as possible. Obviously these linear lists are a solution to the dictionary problem. These lists are sensible uh, if we want to maintain a small dictionary consisting of only a few dozen items, let's say in a compiler. Uh, another interesting application is data compression using these lists. It is possible to build effective, very effective data compression uh, schemes. Early work uh, on list update assumed that request sequences are generated according to probability distribution and then uh, over the past years people have, have looked at uh, competitiveness and the most, the most important results are as follows. As far as deterministic algorithms are concerned, Slater and Tarjan showed that move to front is too competitive. This is a very simple and, algor a very simple and elegant algorithm that, as the name uh, suggests, moves, simply moves a requested item to the front of the list. And this factor two is best possible. No deterministic strategy can beat the factor of two. There exists yet another deterministic two competitive algorithm called timestamp. This algorithm is relevant basically because it can be used to build good uh, randomized algorithms. On the other hand, um, other well-known popular strategies such as transpose and frequency count are not constant competitive. Their performance guarantee depends on the list length, the number of items uh, in the list. Uh, using randomization, not surprisingly, one can beat uh, the factor of two. Uh, Reingold, Westbrook and Slater proposed a bit algorithm which is moved to front on every second request, but in a randomized fashion the strategy has a performance guarantee of 1.75. It, it is possible to combine bit and the timestamp algorithm I just mentioned to form an algorithm called combination or comb for short which is 1.6 competitive and this is very close to the best known lower bound which is slightly above 1.5. Further algorithms have been proposed in the literature, but most of them are actually variants uh, of the above schemes. While these uh, competitive results are, let's say, interesting and valuable, there are, uh, are some shortcomings. First of all, there exists a, sig a gap, a significant gap between the theoretically proven and the experimentally observed performance guarantees of the algorithms. For instance, the ex uh, experimentally uh, observed performance of move to front is it's much smaller than two. It's actually very close uh, to one. Such experiments were done, for instance, by Ron Rivest and more recently by Bentley and McHugh and Barach uh, at, uh, and Ariane. And the second drawback is that move to front in many applications exhibits the best performance despite the fact that the randomized strategies have slightly uh, smaller performance guarantees. The reasons for all these shortcomings is again that competitive analysis 
allows considers arbitrary request sequences where whereas request sequences uh, arising in practice have a special structure exhibit a uh, locality of reference. In our paper we pr uh, present a study of list update with locality. Uh, I would like to mention that there is some uh, related work, most of which is authored or co-authored by Alex Lopez Ortiz and I'm glad he is here and uh, tomorrow, no, the day after, <laughs> day after tomorrow, uh, will present some of uh, these results. So just very briefly, in two, let's say, first papers, they considered uh, Denning's working set model that we proposed for the paging problem um, in terms of locality, and then using the concept of so-called bijective analysis showed that move to front is always at least as good as any other online strategy. But these papers, as far as I see, do not quantify algorithms performance. Such a quantization was done in another paper on parametrized analysis, uh, which I think Alex will present, talk about on Wednesday. And in addition to these more theoretical uh, works, there are some experimental studies together with Ian Monroe, where they analyzed uh, list update algorithms also with respect uh, to their application in data compression. Now, in our paper, uh, together with Sonia Lauer, we have the following uh, main contribution. So we present a combined theoretical and experimental study of list update with locality of reference. The goal is to close the gap between theory and practice. First of all, we define or we introduce a new locality model that is specifically tailored uh, to the list update problem, it's based uh, on the natural concept of runs. I will explain in a minute what this means. Then using this locality model, we are able to present refined theoretical analysis of various uh, online algorithms. We concentrate on the most important ones, move to front bit and the randomized combination algorithm. In order to analyze this combination, we also had to look at the timestamp strategy again. We looked at two performance measures, the excess or service cost uh, paid uh, on a reference string, and secondly, in the competitive ratio. In addition to these yeah, theoretical results, we did uh, an extensive experimental study with real-world traces from benchmark libraries we considered uh, sequences as they arise in data compression routines and moreover we looked at memory access strings. In total more than 90 traces were considered and for each of the traces, we did a comparison between our new theoretically proven bounds uh, and we compared the theoretical bounds to the experimentally observed performance of the algorithm. The good news is that these theoretical and experimental bounds now match or nearly match the average the average relative error for move to front is below 1% for the other algorithms is a bit higher but still uh, around 5% which I think is small uh, and a second result a second contribution is that move to front responds very well to locality of reference with competitive ratios uh, approaching one as the degree of locality uh, increases in a, in a reference string. And we can also show this does not hold for the other three strategies we looked at. They do not respond well uh, to locality. And we'll see in a moment what this means. In the following, uh, I would like to present some of these results. And let me start with the locality model. So again, locality means when an item is referenced, it's likely to be referenced again uh, soon. And this uh, naturally leads to the concept of runs, where a run in a request sequence is a maximal subsequence of requests made to the same item. So for instance, in this sequence up front, we have a long run of requests made to item X followed by another long run, slightly shorter, of requests uh, made to item Y. Now, if you inspect real-world sequences, unfortunately, they contain very few of these pure uh, long runs, as shown here. But if you look at the end of the sequence, you would probably agree that there is also a high degree of locality for item X. We 
uh, encounter many requests, my laser pointer is bad, we encounter many requests to item X, which are just interlinked by single requests to other items. And these requests to item X would form a long run if we uh, consider smaller item sets and in particular item pairs. And this is what we do in the model. So given an original request sequence, for any pair of distinct items X and Y, we define or we consider a projected sequence, sigma X, Y, that consists of only those requests made to either X or Y. All other requests are cancelled out, so only the requests to X and Y uh, survive. And intuitively, these projected sequences have a high degree of locality or contain many long runs because if one of the items, let's say X, is more significant, more relevant than the other items and this rel uh, relation is likely to hold in the near future and we encounter further requests to this item be before we hit the next request to the other item Y. And now this locality model considers uh, these projected sequences for all pairs of distinct items X uh, and Y. Now for any uh, projected sequence, we introduce various locality parameters. First of all, let R be the total number of runs, run being again a subsequence of request to the same item. A run is called long if it has length at least two, otherwise the run is called short, so a short run consists of a single request only. Let L be the number of long runs and then it turns out to uh, properly analyze algorithms performance we need a third parameter which is maybe not so intuitively uh, intuitive, it's the number of long run changes. So a long run and the next one occurring in the sequence form a long run change if they reference different items. For example, here up front the first two long runs to X and Y do form a long run change, they reference different items but the last two long runs, which are both to X, do not form such a long run change. It's not very intuitive for the moment, but uh, the algorithm or the performance of the algorithms depend on these uh, long run changes. Then uh, we sum up these locality uh, parameters. So R is the total number of runs summed over all item pairs, and similarly we have the number of long runs, number of long run changes. Then, using these uh, locality parameters, we can analyze algorithms' performance. Uh, first of all, the excess cost. This slide shows the excess cost for the various algorithms, and the excess cost of move to front is exactly equal to the number of runs plus the length of the request sequence. And likewise, we can do refined analysis of the other algorithms in terms of our parameters. For the other algorithms, the expressions are a bit more complicated but I would say not uh, too bad. Important aspect is that we can develop a new lower bound on the optimum cost, which is basically half times the number of runs plus the number of uh, long run changes. Then, given these bounds on the excess cost, we can move on and evaluate uh, competitiveness, and this slide shows the calculation for move to front. So again, competitiveness, we divide the excess cost online to the excess cost offline or let's our bound on the our lower bound on the optimum uh, excess cost and then simple algebraic manipulation give that this competitiveness is upper bounded by 2 over 1 plus lambda where lambda now is the, num is the ratio number of long run changes divided by the total number of runs. And note that this parameter lambda ranges between 0 and 1. It can be as high as 1 on request sequences is exhibiting a high degree of locality. So if a request sequence consists of uh, long runs only, then this parameter can be as high uh, as one, or this ratio can be as high as one. And now as lambda goes to one, uh, obviously the competitiveness tends to one, and this means that move to front actually responds perfectly uh, to locality of reference. We can do a similar uh, calculation for the other algorithms and uh, as an example uh, I show, can show you the calculation for bit. Again, 
we divide onla uh, online cost by the optimum cost and obtain that for bid the competitiveness is equal, uh, yeah, uh, given by the minimum of 1.75 uh, and 2 plus lambda, uh, 2 plus lambda over 1 plus lambda. And now, as lambda uh, goes to 1, we obtain a ratio of 1.5, but we do not obtain a ratio which goes as down. Uh, which goes down to one. So bit, and this holds two for the other algorithms as well, do not respond well uh, to locality. Then we complemented these results uh, by an experimental study. Again, the main goal was to compare the new theoretical bounds to the bounds we observe in practice as far as service cost and competitiveness are concerned. I mentioned already we took uh, real-world traces from benchmark libraries for data compression. There are many such uh, libraries, the Calgary Corpus, Canterbury Corpus. Many of you know that uh, the popular compression algorithm BZIP2 relies on a so-called barros wheeler transformation followed by move to front encoding. But in addition to these data compression traces, we also looked at memory access traces. And uh, I mentioned already that the errors we observe uh, between theory and practice are now very small, below 1% for move to front, actually as far as excess cost uh, is concerned. The error is 0% we have because we have an exact bound on the service cost of move to front. For the other algorithms, the errors are a bit higher, but still I would say low, uh, around 5%. Uh, yeah, one can now study all this uh, data that arises. This slide shows. Uh, Question about those numbers? Yeah. On the left side? On the other slide. So, yeah. when you say competitive ratio on these traces, so does that mean you look at the trace, you compute lambda, and then you plug lambda into your formula, and that's what it is? <laughs> but these, these are only empirical. This isn't theoretical stuff. This is just empirical. This is empirical. Okay. Uh, still, there is a point there. Uh, so you compare this to like what two over one plus lambda is? No, no. You, so you uh, compare in the com experimental competitiveness. You look at the ratio online cost by the optimum cost. Now the optimum uh, problem is an NP-hard problem. So what we did is uh, we took. Oops, now it's on the wrong direction. So we took our lower bound. So actually the errors would be even smaller then. We took this lower bound on the optimum cost and the optimum might actually be higher. So this is actually a pessimistic estimate of the error. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. So this slide depicts uh, the errors using these uh, box plots, which is a standard means to display numerical data. Maybe you have seen those plots before. So we have the various algorithms. For each algorithm we analyze, I don't know, 45 traces. And then we have for each algorithm about 45 data points. Now the bold line always represents the median data point. Uh, the box contains 50% of the data points for 25% is located above and below the median, so the height of a box basically represents the variance in data. And then uh, also, uh, yeah, these, the uh, uppermost line, the lower, mo uh, the lower line is the, always represent the outermost point that can be found at a distance of 1.5 between uh, the interquartile range and all other points are outliers. What you see basically is that everything is very well behaved, the median data point is very low, the height of the boxes is very low, and uh, we have very few outliers. So, so not only is the average error uh, very low, but uh, yeah, the variance in data is also very slow. I think I conclude uh, at this point. Um, so in summary, as far as the second part of the talk is concerned, we introduced uh, a new model specifically designed for list update, presented new theoretical analysis that hopefully capture uh, phenomena that are ob observed in practice. It shows that move to front is an excellent algorithm method of choice in practice. And in general, more generally, I think that these combined 
theoretical and experimental studies could be done for other uh, problems as well. Maybe one could do it for scheduling, where usually resource augmentation is used to overcome negative results. But there, again, the challenge is to find yeah, suitable models uh, characterizing the job sequences. And yeah, I do not know how to do this. Thank you for your attention. supercomputer centers and we were able to get some data, I'm not sure by now, that might be outdated. It's very difficult for scheduling to find the data because you probably do not want to make any probabilistic assumptions, so you want, do not want to generate uh, jobs according to a probability distribution. This is even more difficult depending on the problem you look at. So uh, we are for the energy efficient scheduling, the most classical problem is, uh, is a problem setting where jobs have deadlines. So not only do they have processing times or processing volumes, but also deadlines. So you need basically two parameters that you and yeah. It's <laughs> I would be glad if some benchmark library were allowed. So, I mean, so the, the ask you surveyed the you know, online algorithms, people thought a lot about sort of ideas to do the worst case analysis a long time ago. So, I mean, of that list of ideas, I mean, how many seem sort of appropriate only for online analysis versus how many hmm. potentially more broadly useful to say the you know, online algorithms, performance heuristics, and so on? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So resource augmentation, I very much like the idea, but of course it's a trick in the analysis. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a means to remove uh, the very bad performance guarantees. It does not improve the algorithm and uh, basically you don't get any further inside to the problem, let's say. Refined performance measures could be maybe an approach uh, that applies to more general settings. What is this? I also like this framework by Kutsu, Piers, and Papa Dimitrio. I'm a bit skeptical uh, about the probability distribution. The question is always, what are realistic distributions to find them? And at least I always found average case analysis extremely hard. But maybe there are more clever people in the audience who can do this, this average case analysis. Well, they, they, do, <laughs> they do do worst case over a class. Yeah, uh, of course. here. You have a class of inputs or a class of distrib uh, distributions, and then you, you pick uh, a distribution. This is, I, I, I think, very nice. So this could be well suited to, to other settings as well. I do remember, as far as list update is concerned, of course, there is this huge body of literature addressing list update under the assumption that you have a probability distribution. And then the big step forward, uh, but later in time, then you look at competitive analysis instead of uh, probability distribution. Now it seems <laughs> we are again moving back to the prob uh, probabilistic framework. But yeah, and what, what else did we have? Uh, the data modeling, yeah. Uh, I like the data modeling, but of course, yeah. It works well for the access problems, memory access problem locality is very natural and well accepted. I'm not sure about computer science problems in general. 
uh, if there is always such a neat underlying uh, model that, that could, can be identified. So as when Adrian Blum talked about clustering, I saw it could, and I said it, it would actually fail because clustering, it's, we cluster this thing because we want to get information uh, about the data. Isn't it, or sort of, it, we, we, we have this massive data set and want to find out what is it like. So if we knew what the input is, maybe we wouldn't really cluster, sort of, I mean. So we want to get information about the data, and, and it's very hard maybe to uh, come up with a model that will characterize uh, the input. So I see, I see problems there. Facility location. No, no, generally for computer science. So here, uh, these approaches have been looked at and. Yeah, so what is applicable what is applicable to I think I think uh, the 